Chapters 15 through 17 of The Devil's Pool. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Devil's Pool by Georges Song. Translated by George B. Ives. Chapter 15 The Return to the Farm. Within a quarter of an hour they had crossed the moors. They trotted along the high road, and Grise neighed at every familiar object. Petit Pierre told his father what had taken place, so far as he had been able to understand it. "'When we got there,' he said, "'that man came and talked to my Marie in the sheepfold, where we went first to see the fine sheep. I'd got up into the crib to play, and that man didn't see me. Then he said good day to my Marie, and then he kissed her. "'You let him kiss you, Marie?' said Germain, trembling with anger. "'I thought it was a compliment, a custom of the place for new arrivals, just as Grandma, at your house, kisses the girls who take service with her, to show that she adopts them and will be like a mother to them.' "'And then,' continued Petit Pierre, who was very proud to have a story to tell, "'that man said something naughty, something you told me not to say, and not to remember, so I forgot it right away. But if my papa wants me to tell him what it was— No, my Pierre, I don't want to hear it, and I don't want you to remember it ever. Then I'll forget it again, said the child. And then that man acted as if he was mad because Marie said she was going away. He told her he'd give her all she wanted, a hundred francs. And my Marie got mad, too. Then he went at her, just like he was going to hurt her. I was afraid, and I ran up to Marie and cried. Then that man said like this, What's that? Where did that child come from? And he put up his stick to beat me. But my Marie stopped him, and she said like this, We will talk by and by, monsieur. Now I must take this child to Fourche, and then I'll come back again. And as soon as he'd gone out of the sheepfold, my Marie says to me like this, Let's run away, my Pierre. We must go away right off, for that man's a bad man, and he would only hurt us. Then we went behind the barns, and crossed a little field, and went to Fourche to look for you. But you weren't there, and they wouldn't let us wait for you. And then that man came up behind us on his black horse, and we ran still farther away. And then we went and hid in the woods. Then he came, too, and we hid when we heard him coming. And then, when he'd gone by, we began to run for ourselves so as to go home. And then at last you came and found us. And that's all there was. I didn't forget anything, did I, my Marie? No, Pierre. And it's the truth. Now, Germain, you will bear witness for me and tell everybody at home that it wasn't for lack of courage and being willing to work that I couldn't stay over yonder. And I will ask you, Marie, said Germain, to ask yourself the question whether, when it comes to defending a woman and punishing a knave, a man of twenty-eight isn't too old? I'd like to know if Bastien, or any other pretty boy who has the advantage of being ten years younger than I am, wouldn't have been crushed by that man, as Petit Pierre calls him. What do you think about it? I think, Germain, that you have done me a very great service, and that I shall thank you for it all my life. Is that all? My little father, said the child, I didn't think to tell little Marie what I promised you. I didn't have time, but I'll tell her at home, and I'll tell Grandma, too. This promise on his child's part gave Germain abundant food for reflection. The problem now was how to explain his position to his family, and while setting forth his grievances against the widow Guerin, to avoid telling them what other thoughts had predisposed him to be so keen-sighted and so harsh in his judgment. When one is happy and proud, the courage to make others accept one's happiness seems easily within reach. But to be rebuffed in one direction and blamed in another is not a very pleasant plight. Luckily, Pierre was asleep when they reached the farm, and Germain put him down on his bed without waking him. Then he entered upon such explanations as he was able to give. Père Maurice, sitting upon his three-legged stool in the doorway, listened gravely to him, and although he was ill-pleased with the result of the expedition, when Germain, after describing the widow's system of coquetry, asked his father-in-law if he had time to go and pay court to her fifty-two Sundays in the year, with the chance of being dismissed at the end of the year, the old man replied, nodding his head in token of assent, "'You are not wrong, Germain. That couldn't be.' And again, when Germain told how he had been compelled to bring little Marie home again, 
without loss of time, to save her from the insults, perhaps from the violence, of an unworthy master, Père Maurice again nodded assent, saying, "'You are not wrong, Germain. That's as it should be.' When Germain had finished his story and given all his reasons, his father-in-law and mother-in-law simultaneously uttered a heavy sigh of resignation as they exchanged glances. Then the head of the family rose, saying, "'Well, God's will be done. Affection isn't made to order.' "'Come to supper, Germain,' said the mother-in-law. "'It's a pity that couldn't be arranged better. However, it wasn't God's will, it seems. We must look somewhere else.' "'Yes,' the old man added. "'As my wife says, we must look somewhere else.' There was no further sound in the house, and when Petit Pierre rose the next morning with the larks at dawn, being no longer excited by the extraordinary events of the last two days, he relapsed into the normal apathy of little peasants of his age, forgot all that had filled his little head, and thought of nothing but playing with his brothers and being a man with the horses and oxen. Germain tried to forget, too, by plunging into his work again, but he became so melancholy and so absent-minded that everybody noticed it. He did not speak to little Marie, he did not even look at her, and yet, if any one had asked him in which pasture she was, or in what direction she had gone, there was not an hour in the day when he could not have told if he had chosen to reply. He had not dared ask his people to take her on at the farm during the winter, and yet he was well aware that she must be suffering from poverty. But she was not suffering, and Mère Guillet could never understand why her little store of wood never grew less, and how her shed was always filled in the morning when she had left it almost empty the night before. It was the same with the wheat and potatoes. Someone came through the window in the loft, and emptied a bag on the floor without waking anybody or leaving any tracks. The old woman was anxious and rejoiced at the same time. She bade her daughter not mention the matter, saying that if people knew what was happening in her house they would take her for a witch. She really believed that the devil had a hand in it. But she was by no means eager to fall out with him by calling upon the cure to exorcise him from her house. She said to herself that it would be time to do that when Satan came and demanded her soul, in exchange for his benefactions. Little Marie had a clearer idea of the truth, but she dared not speak to Germain for fear that he would recur to his idea of marriage, and she pretended when with him to notice nothing. CHAPTER Sixteen, Mère Maurice One day Mère Maurice, being alone in the orchard with Germain, said to him affectionately, my poor son, I don't think you're well. You don't eat as much as usual, you never laugh, and you talk less and less. Has any one in the house? Have we ourselves wounded you, without meaning to do it, or knowing that we have done it?' "'No, mother,' replied Germain. "'You have always been as kind to me as the mother who brought me into the world, and I should be an ungrateful fellow if I complained of you, or your husband, or any one in the house.' "'In that case, my child, it must be that your grief for your wife's death has come back. Instead of lessening with time, your loneliness grows worse, and you absolutely must do what your father-in-law very wisely advised. You must marry again. Yes, mother, that would be my idea, too. But the women you advise me to seek don't suit me. When I see them, instead of forgetting Catherine, I think of her all the more. The trouble, apparently, is, Germain, that we haven't succeeded in divining your taste so you must help us by telling us the truth. Doubtless there's a woman somewhere who was made for you, for the good Lord doesn't make anybody without putting by his happiness for him and somebody else. So if you know where to go for the wife you need, go and get her, whether she's pretty or ugly, young or old, rich or poor. We have made up our minds, my old man and I, to give our consent, for we're tired of seeing you so sad, and we can't live at peace if you are not. "'You are as good as the good Lord, mother, and so is father,' replied Germain. "'But your compassion can't cure my trouble. The girl I would like won't have me.' "'Is it because she's too young?' "'It's unwise for you to put your thoughts on a young girl.' "'Well, yes, mother, I am foolish enough to have become attached to a young girl, and I blame myself for it. I do all I can not to think of her, but whether I am at work or resting, whether I am at mass or in my bed, with my children or with you, I think of her all the time, and can't think of anything else. Why, it's as if there'd been a spell cast on you, Germain, isn't it? 
There's only one cure for it, and that is to make the girl change her mind and listen to you. So I must take a hand in it, and see if it can't be done. You tell me where she lives, and what her name is. Alas, my dear mother, I don't dare, said Germain, for you'll laugh at me. No, I won't laugh at you, Germain, because you're in trouble, and I don't want to make it any worse for you. Can it be Fanchette? No, mother, not her. Or Rosette? No. Tell me, then, for I won't stop if I have to name all the girls in the province. Germain hung his head, and could not make up his mind to reply. Well, said Mère Maurice, I leave you in peace for to-day, Germain. Perhaps to-morrow you will feel more like trusting me, or your sister-in-law will show more skill in questioning you. And she picked up her basket to go and stretch her linen on the bushes. Germain acted like children who make up their minds when they see that you have ceased to pay any attention to them. He followed his mother-in-law, and at last gave her the name in fear and trembling. La Guillet's Little Marie. Great was Mère Maurice's surprise. She was the last one of whom she would have thought. But she had the delicacy not to cry out at it, and to make her comments mentally. Then, seeing that her silence was oppressive to Germain, she held out her basket to him, saying, "'Well, is that any reason why you shouldn't help me in my work? Carry this load, and come and talk with me. Have you reflected, Germain? Have you made up your mind?' "'Alas, dear mother, that's not the way you must talk. My mind would be made up if I could succeed, but as I shouldn't be listened to, I have made up my mind simply to cure myself if I can.' "'And if you can't?' "'Everything in its time, Mère Maurice. When the horse is overloaded, he falls, and when the ox has nothing to eat, he dies.' That is to say that you will die if you don't succeed, eh? God forbid, Germain. I don't like to hear a man like you say such things as that, because when he says them, he thinks them. You're a very brave man, and weakness is a dangerous thing in strong men. Come, take hope. I can't imagine how a poor girl, who is much honoured by having you want her, can refuse you. It's the truth, though. She does refuse me. What reasons does she give you? that you have always been kind to her, that her family owes a great deal to yours, and that she doesn't want to displease you by turning me away from a wealthy marriage. If she says that, she shows good feeling, and it's very honest on her part. But when she tells you that, Germain, she doesn't cure you, for she tells you she loves you, I don't doubt, and that she'd marry you if you were willing. That's the worst of it. She says that her heart isn't drawn toward me. If she says what she doesn't mean, the better to keep you away from her. She's a child who deserves to have us love her, and to have us overlook her youth, because of her great common sense. Yes, said Germain, struck with a hope he had not before conceived. It would be very good, and very comme il faut on her part. But if she's so sensible, I'm very much afraid it's because she doesn't like me. Germain, said Mère Maurice, you must promise to keep quiet the whole week, and not worry but eat and sleep, and be gay as you used to be. I'll speak to my old man, and if I bring him round, then you can find out the girl's real feeling with regard to you. Germain promised, and the week passed without Père Maurice saying a word to him in private, or giving any sign that he suspected anything. The ploughman tried hard to seem tranquil, but he was paler and more perturbed than ever. CHAPTER Seventeen, LITTLE Marie. At last, on Sunday morning, as they came out from Mass, his mother-in-law asked him what he had obtained from his sweetheart since their interview in the orchard. "'Why, nothing at all,' he replied. "'I haven't spoken to her.' "'How do you expect to persuade her, pray, if you don't speak to her?' "'I have never spoken to her but once,' said Germain. "'That was when we went to Forge together. And since then I haven't said a single word to her. Her refusal hurt me so, that I prefer not to hear her tell me again that she doesn't love me.' "'Well, my son, you must speak to her now. Your father-in-law authorizes you to do it. Come, make up your mind. I tell you to do it, and if necessary I insist on it, for you can't remain in this state of doubt.' Germain obeyed. He went to Mère Guillet's with downcast eyes and an air of profound depression. Little Marie was alone in the chimney-corner, musing so deeply that she did not hear Germain come in. When she saw him before her she leaped from her chair in surprise, and her face flushed. "'Little Marie,' he said, sitting beside her, "'I have pained you and wearied you. I know. 
but the man and the woman at our house so designating the heads of the family in accordance with custom want me to speak to you and ask you to marry me you won't be willing to do it i expect that germain replied little marie have you made up your mind that you love me that offends you i know but it isn't my fault if you could change your mind i would be too happy and i suppose i don't deserve to have it so come look at me marie am i so very frightful no germain she replied with a smile you're better looking than i am don't laugh at me look at me indulgently i haven't lost a hair or a tooth yet my eyes tell you that i love you look into my eyes it's written there and every girl knows how to read that writing marie looked into germain's eyes with an air of playful assurance then she suddenly turned her head away and began to tremble ah mon dieu i frighten you said germain you look at me as if i were the farmer of Ormeaux. Don't be afraid of me, I beg of you. That hurts me too much. I won't say bad words to you. I won't kiss you against your will. And when you want me to go away, you have only to show me the door. Tell me, must I go out so that you stop trembling? Marie held out her hand to the ploughman, but without turning her head, which was bent toward the fireplace, and without speaking. I understand, said Germain. You pity me, for you are kind-hearted. You are sorry to make me unhappy. But still you can't love me, can you? Why do you say such things to me, Germain? Little Marie replied at last. Do you want to make me cry? Poor little girl, you have a kind heart, I know. But you don't love me, and you hide your face from me because you're afraid to let me see your displeasure and your repugnance. And for my part, I don't dare do so much as press your hand. In the woods, when my son was asleep, and you were asleep also, I came near kissing you softly but I should have died of shame rather than ask you for a kiss, and I suffered as much that night as a man roasting over a slow fire. Since then I've dreamed of you every night. Ah, how I have kissed you, Marie! But you slept without dreaming all the time. And now do you know what I think? That if you should turn and look at me with such eyes as I have for you, and if you should put your face to mine, I believe I should fall dead with joy. And as for you— you are thinking that if such a thing should happen to you, you would die of anger and shame. Germain talked as if he were dreaming, and did not know what he said. Little Marie was still trembling, but as he was trembling even more than she, he did not notice it. Suddenly she turned. She was all in tears, and looked at him with a reproachful expression. The poor ploughman thought that that was the last stroke, and rose to go, without awaiting his sentence but the girl detained him by throwing her arms about him, and hid her face against his breast. "'Ah, Germain,' she said, sobbing, "'haven't you guessed that I love you?' Germain would have gone mad, had not his son, who was looking for him, and who entered the cottage galloping on a stick with his little sister en croup, lashing the imaginary steed with a willow switch, recalled him to himself. He lifted him up, and said, as he put him in his fiancée's arms, you have made more than one person happy by loving me. End of chapters 15, 16, and 17 of The Devil's Pool